So it's uh, nice to have you all welcome to the second part of our series co-sponsored by Plantation. So we are talking about having difficult conversations with kids. My name is Shannon Wharton. I'm a licensed psychologist and I'm here at Nova Southeastern University in our psychology services center, one of our specialty clinics, the school related assessment um, and interventions and consultation clinic. And so we really focus on working with kids across all age ranges, not only in school related issues, but in general, well being, mental health, really anything that is of um, concern. And so with me today are two of our graduate students. I'll pass it along to them to introduce themselves and then we'll jump into the content. So Tyler, I'll, I'll hand it to you first. All right. Hello everybody, I'm Tyler McCoy. I'm a third year doctoral student here at Nova Southeastern. And um, prior to returning to school, I was a specialist level school psychologist. And so I'm excited to be here and to uh, participate in this short chat with you all. Hi everyone, my name is Catalina. I'm also a graduate student here in the school psychology program. Prior to you know, starting graduate school, I was a preschool teacher for kids with autism and developmental disabilities. So I have nice experience working with little people with big feelings and I'm excited to be here as well. So how we'll structure this, Tyler and Catalina will spend the first part of the session talking about general principles for having difficult conversations with kids and then get into some specifics what to say, particular conversation topics that might be difficult. And then I will end our time together and talk about some active and reflective listening skills. And so I will pass it back to the two of you. All right, so, um, so welcome everybody. Um, I think we, we're, we're one slide ahead. But, so I um, welcome everybody to um, today's, as Dr. Warren just said, our topic today is to discuss um, difficult conversations with children and adolescents. Um, we have some sample conversation starters to um, help facilitate discussions with kids. And we'll be talking about active learning strategies and some resources. And we do have a lot to cover, so don't, um, be alarmed if we don't get to talk about every single slide, but this will be a resource that will be available on the presentation so you can refer back to um, going forward if there was something that you wanted to refer back to. Um, so ways that help build um, having difficult conversations with kids is to start building in those conversations and to build it in when it feels natural and during times and during your routines, during the day, um, and other times, like maybe during car rides or time that you can have some conversations with kids during meal times, or even some less obvious moments, like when you're watching TV or movies and there's something that can be a springboard to having a conversation about any kind of a matter. Those are all opportunities to help increase and facilitate conversation with your kids. So some good general communication strategies. Um, you want to follow your child's lead in conversations and when talking with kids about difficult topics it's important to remain calm model staying calm with your child um, you want to be reassuring and answer their questions um, that they're asking if you um, bring up other topics that might be related but they're not really curious about that could create some unnecessary worry for them and don't worry about if you have all the answers or not it's okay to not have all the answers and to just let your child know that you know it's okay I don't know that right now but I'm available here to talk to you and we can find out those answers together and to use those active listening skills which um, Dr. Wharton will be sharing with us um, in a little while. So some guidelines for talking with children at different ages, the most important thing is to not lie to your children. So don't tell like partial truths or make up information. If you don't know, again, just you can tell them that you don't know. And also sometimes saying things like that will never happen to you 
or I will always protect you. Those can be perceived as children as lies or not telling the truth because you can't guarantee um, that nothing bad will ever happen. Um, but as we'll get into um, a little later, we'll come up with some, uh, have some other phrases and things that you can say to your children to, for reassurance that they won't necessarily perceive as a partial truth or, or a lie. And with early elementary students, it's really important to use brief, simple explanations and to balance facts with appropriate reinsurances. For upper elementary and early middle school children, you want to clarify any rumors um, that they might have been hearing uh, in the news or from their friends or on social media and to help them distinguish what's fact versus fantasy and um, what's real versus not real. Provide reassurance to your those to your um, your middle schoolers and your elementary students as well. Be an active listener, and with high schoolers and upper middle school students, answer questions with clear, concise, in depth responses. They can handle a little bit more discussion on things and be honest and accurate with any information that you're giving them. Um, I was mentioned a couple of times, and make sure you can direct them to factual resources that you trust. Um, and maybe look up some of those sources with your student. Mm -hmm. So before you begin and before you start getting into the content of these conversations, you really want to set yourself up for success. The most important thing that you can do is to wait until you feel calm. So depending on what the topic is, even though it might be an urgent discussion, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's an emergency, right? So if at all possible, you want to wait to hold the conversation until you can do so in a meaningful way. If we don't, what ends up happening is that, you know, the passion, our strong feelings for whatever the subject might be, might cause us to speak purely out of emotion and say things that either really aren't helpful or are actually hurtful, depending on what's said. So again, you want to be calm enough to bring up the subject without yelling, without making accusations, and without saying things that you might regret and are better off left unsaid. The other thing to consider is the goal of the conversation. So what exactly is the reason why you want to have this conversation? And what is the outcome that you would either expect or that you're hoping for, right? You'd like to gain a better understanding of your emotions. And that way it can help keep yourself in check during, during these conversations. This means that you really want to be honest with yourself about what you're feeling and also what you're fearing, right? So maybe it's something that you're not sure what the outcome will be or how the person will react. And so you, you might be afraid of having the conversation, which can cause you to avoid it altogether. And sometimes that's not the best decision either. The second thing is that sometimes you'll need to educate yourself. So maybe if it's a subject you're unfamiliar with, if it's a controversial issue, you want to get make sure that you have all the evidence from both sides. You don't want to arm yourself so that you can argue better, but you want to be open to being able to understand different points of view. So this can be by researching online or talking to people who either have experience talking to their children or have personally lived through experiences that you'll be talking about. As we'll mention a few times, you want to be an active listener. You want to listen well and be empathetic. And one way to do this is by asking open-ended questions. We'll talk a little bit more about how a conversation is not a soliloquy. It's not a lecture, you know, it's not just you speaking at your child, but rather the back and forth dialogue between two people. And by asking open ended questions, you're really taking into account the other person's thoughts, feelings, and what their goals with speaking about the subject might be. The final thing you want to think about before having a big conversation is how to offer practical support, right? So like Tyler mentioned previously, we don't just wanna say, oh, don't worry about it, it'll never happen to you or everything is going to be okay. You may wanna take some time to prepare some things that you can actively do in the moment to help yourself either feel better or to make amends or in any other way of the word to alleviate the problem. 
So some big things to remember is that it's not usually one big talk. You know, it's not just a sit down event where you finish the conversation and then you never have to pick up again, but it's more likely a series of little talks throughout childhood, you know, depending on the age of your child and the topic at hand, it might be something that they don't have a developmental age to understand fully yet. And so you offer them what's appropriate for their age. And then as they get older, you can add more nuance, more details, and really check in with their understanding at that point in time. It's important as parents that you don't need to know all of the answers. So whether it's a concept that you're initiating or if it's a question that your child has asked, it's okay to say that you're not sure. It's okay to take time and research what you want to say or learn about the subject. Depending on what it is, you might even want to learn together, you know, showing your child not only is there room for growth, but that there's also no need uh, for perfection and to, to know everything at the same time. You can even admit that it's awkward or a hard thing to explain. We're all human and we're all uncomfortable or comfortable with different things. So, for example, speaking with your children, if they bring up a topic that you're not really ready to discuss, so for example, sex, death, pornography, it can be triggering if you're caught off guard. And so you can admit that you're not ready to talk about it or that it is an awkward conversation to have, but that you're glad that they trust you with being able to leave this. You're also the right person to discuss these topics as a loved one, right? So whether you're a parent or if you're a teacher, an administrator, you don't have to be an expert in any of these topics, but by being the person that these kids sought out, you're the right person, right? For a reason. As I mentioned previously, it's not a soliloquy. So make sure that you're not just preparing a monologue you want to keep in mind the open-ended questions that we'll give examples of in a little bit so that you're really taking into consideration the other person's thoughts. You can think about it first. So again, if you're not ready for the discussion in the moment, you can ask for some time. You can say, hey, I really want to continue this discussion with you. I'm just not ready at the moment. Why don't we talk about it tomorrow or whatever time frame that you need? And most importantly, you can have a do-over. So if you look back at the conversation that you have and you think either, oh, I could have really said that better or I really forgot to say this and I wanted to, you can go back to the child and say, hey, remember when we were talking about this? When I said this, I meant that. Or actually, I forgot to tell you about these things. I wanted to see if we can discuss it further and continue on the conversation until you reach, you know, great understanding between both of you. So after you set yourself up for success and you're ready to have the conversation, these are some things you wanna keep in mind in order to get started. So the first thing would be to watch for clues that your child is the one that wants to talk. So a lot of the times children are going to feel very awkward bringing things up to you and they might hover around you. They might be saying like, hey, never mind, never mind. Eh, never mind. So things like that. Read their body language. Uh, you know your child best. So think about what you think that they're thinking and, uh, and go from there, right? You may want to ask them what they already know about a situation. So for example, if there's something an event that has taken place at school, you may want to ask them, hey, what have you heard about this? Or what have you seen? What are you thinking? What are your friends thinking or saying about these things? And you want to be mindful of the words you choose when speaking about the situation. So we know that words can either heighten or reduce our feelings of stress, of fear and anxiety. And this is an important reason of why we don't want to start a conversation before we're calm and ready, right? Because if we go into something like, oh my gosh, this is horrible. The world is ending. This is crazy. We're not going to make our child feel better. We're not going to make our friends feel better. 
So you really want to be mindful of the things that you're saying. And finally, you want to be available for those follow-up conversations. So whether it's your belief that it shouldn't be a one one setting conversation, or if it's the child who needs more clarification later on, be open to sitting down and having these conversations every so often. And again, it doesn't have to be anything super formal. It could be, as Tyler mentioned, during a car ride, while you're waiting in line, uh, whatever feels right for the situation and for your child and, and your family. So some types of difficult conversations that you might have, some of them are, can be a little bit silly, like, you know, if fictional characters like the Tooth Fairy and the Easter Bunny, if they're real or not, those might seem a lot simpler to us than, for example, at the bottom, you'll see a death in the family or a death in your social circle or, you know, having um, heard of a suicide. So there's definitely a range of the types of conversations that you might have. With kids, a lot of the time, it can be concerns about friends, right? We definitely want to be open so that they feel safe in sharing with us. Uh, if they want to share about bullying or other types of interpersonal conflicts, as well as puberty and sexuality or sexual health. And the thing to remember about these difficult conversations is that they don't always follow the timeline that we think they should or that we think they will. And so again, be aware of those cues that your child is giving you or cues that they don't know they're giving you but are leaving you know, clues behind uh, to make sure that you're addressing them in a timely fashion. So some of the open-ended questions and therefore sentence starters that you can use are, and remember, these are just examples you know, don't make it so that it's a script or that it sounds unnatural to something you would say. But for example, you can say, hey, I'd like to talk about this with you. But first, I'd like to get your point of view. So again, what are we doing here? We're saying that we want to have a conversation and we're showing that we want to have a conversation because we're asking them first for their point of view. So Instead of saying, hey, I want to talk to you about this. This is how it goes. These are the rules and it's my house. So it is what it is. You're inviting them to share their side. You might also say things like, I think we have different perceptions about blank. I'd like to hear your thinking on this. Or I need your help with something. Can we talk about it soon or tomorrow or today? Again, whatever timeline might fit best. And so sometimes um, kids might ask you questions and they might ask you questions that you find tough to answer. And so it's, you know, sometimes it's good to have some responses for your, for the kids if they're asking you something that you, you find tough to talk about or something that you don't know the answer about. So we, again, as Carolyn said, these aren't necessarily scripts, but these are some suggestions or some ideas of some things that we might be able to say. So you could say just simply, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked me about that and get the conversation flowing from there using some of those other, those other starters that Catalina just shared. Well, what, what do you know about that? What, why are you curious about that? Tell me about this um, to kind of get that conversation going. Or you alternately ask them, well, what do you think that means? And so you're getting their perspective first and it kind of gives you a sounding board to go off of and um, as we get into those active listening skills, it'll, you'll be able to have some other um, responses back to them. You can also tell them things like, you know what, if you're not sure about it, I don't know. It's okay to admit to um, young people, youth, children and adolescents that you don't know the answers. We don't all know the answers to everything. And that reminds them that you're also a person and that you know there's some things that we need to find out together so you can let them know that I can find out for, for you and let get back to you on what I learned um, or you can say something like let's find out together so that we can um, work together through this those are some examples of some ways to respond if children are asking questions that maybe you don't know the answers to um, so one tough topic to to talk about sometimes is bullying, especially if you think your child 
or a child in your class or somebody, a child that you know is being bullied, um, you can just simply start by saying, you know what, I want to ask you about your day. Tell me what are two best things about your day and listen to what they say. And then what are some two of the worst things about your day? And their answers can give you clues sometimes as to the things that are going on with them to help open that window for other um, further discussion. Um, you might even ask them if they were a superhero and they could help other kids, what powers would they want to have? And again, that kind of gives you an insight into um, hearing and knowing about some things that might be going on with them and how they might um, work to help other kids. It might be a reflection of something that's going on with them. Um, it opens that door and that window for you to have other discussions. Um, maybe finding out from them who are the adults that they uh, can talk to if they feel scared, who are the people that they feel like they're able to be open with and can talk to, and if they ever wish that these adults would help them more, and finding out what makes them scared um, to help give you some ideas of what are, even if it's not about bullying or some other activities or other things that make them feel scared, to open that conversation up to discussing some strategies. I know in the last shark chat, there was some strategies that were discussed for coping skills. Um, and, you know, finding out from them how they feel that the adults in their lives, parents or teachers can best support them or to help stop bullying can help also to facilitate the conversation. So sometimes the topic itself isn't difficult, but the conversation is. So the example that I'm thinking of is, you know, if you have a teenager who is sneaking out, right? We can use a sample format like this to have a better conversation than if we did otherwise. So for example, you want to start out with an I statement and you want to keep it short, right? So Again, we're going with the sneaking out example. I can say, I feel scared, right? If a feeling is usually one word or phrase, if you're saying more than one word or phrase, it's, it's more so like a thought that you're having. And so you're sharing information, but you're starting to lose the feeling that you should be harnessing. My concern is that your safety might be at risk. I would like to gain your trust in a way that you can tell me when you want to go out or maybe you're what you'd like to say is I would like to be informed of when you're going out right what do you feel about that idea how do you how do you feel what do you think about it so again you've shared your point of view you've highlighted your feelings your concern what you wish the outcome to be and again, you're taking into consideration their thoughts. So of course, if it's a teenager, they're going to say, well, mom, I'm 16. I'm practically an adult. I can handle my own safety and you should just let me do what I want to do. <laughs> and so in order to uh, politely disagree in an effective manner, you can say, yes, I agree that you're 16 and you are very mature. And sometimes you, you think that you're an adult. And at the same time, you're still my child and I want you to be safe. So the important thing about a polite disagreement is that you really want to make sure you're using and instead of but. When you say, yes, I agree that you're 16, but then you're negating that first statement. So you really want to use and in these types of situations. On a more serious note, we have a sample conversation on death that, that we can go over. So the first thing you wanna do is keep it simple. Again, we don't wanna lie. We don't wanna give half truths. We want to convey the information necessary in a way that's age appropriate. So for example, grandpa had to go to the hospital last night. The doctors tried to help, but his heart was too sick and it stopped beating. He died this morning. You wanna follow up by asking, do you have any questions? Or if you can see that the child is visibly confused, maybe you could say, it looks like you have some question, right? So you're inviting them to tell you about their understanding of the topic. With things like death specifically, you do want to make sure 
to use that language. A lot of the time we tend to say they passed away, they're no longer with us, they went to heaven. And that's not very concrete. And even though death is a pretty abstract concept, it really helps understanding, especially for younger children, when we do use that specific word. The next step in having a conversation like this would be to identify emotions. So a lot of the times when we feel these powerful emotions, we don't really know what they are. So it would be ideal if you can help them label it. So you seem angry or you, you seem really sad, you're crying. This is a very sad thing. So not just identifying it, but also empathizing with it and normalizing it, right? So saying that, it's okay to cry. It's a natural reaction or, you know, it's okay to feel angry and to want to throw something. Um, so again, just really empathizing with what they feel in the moment. You want to reiterate the truth. So maybe by saying cancer is not contagious or your grandpa loved you very much. So both of these are reassuring in different ways, right? If a child starts to wonder, you know, am I going to die? Did I get cancer because I hugged grandpa? Things like that. You can reassure them again by providing this truth. And you want to end by providing the opportunity for future conversations and more clarification later on. So you can say, hey, if you have any other questions or if you want to talk more about this, I'm here for you and you can come talk to me whenever you want. Sometimes uh, for other types of difficult conversations, again, like fictional characters, some tips that are helpful are by listening carefully. So the kids may not be ready for the whole truth, right? Sometimes we want to keep the magic alive for them. But when you do confirm the truth of fictional characters, you might need to prepare yourself for the big feelings that are to come. So maybe there's a way to keep new, the magic alive. So for example, if a child finds out that the tooth fairy isn't real anymore, then one of those problem solving tips that are practical solutions are for him or her to learn to be the tooth fairy for somebody else. So if they have a younger sibling, maybe they can be the ones in charge of putting a little quarter or a dollar under the pillow at night when they lose a tooth. And that way, it helps them kind of foster this uh, feeling of happiness for their brother. And they feel this loss changes to something a little bit more meaningful through that interaction. So another difficult conversation to have can be divorce or changing family dynamics. Um, one of the things that is really important to keep in mind is that um, one parent should not be the sole parent giving, talking, having this, this tough conversation with the kids. Um, both parents ideally should be giving, um, telling the kids together and reassuring the kids that you love them, that both parents love um, the child and the, the children didn't cause the divorce or the breakup of the family that there's really just some um, issues that are going on between the parents, their adult issues and their adult things and providing that reassurance that these are things that the kids don't have to worry about because you're going to be that safe space still for the child and um, let them know that when the separation is going to take place, tell them who, who's leaving the household, where they're going when they're leaving and let them know what their living arrangements are going to be after the separation occurs. So who are they going to be staying with? Are they going to be switching households? Will they be staying in one household and just having visitation? The, all these questions cause some worry for kids and they don't, they come up with their own answers sometimes. So it's really important to, again, be really honest and open with them and let them know what it's going to be looking like for them. Um, let them know under what circumstances they will be seeing each parent. If they even will be seeing each parent, there might be a circumstance where they're not going to be seeing a certain parent for a while. Um, and let them know how they can contact both parents if that's going to be a, a possibility. What are the parameters surrounding that? 
uh, for them to contact um, the other parent if they're not going to be with them. And one of the mo really most critical things is to avoid having the kids be messengers between the parents. So not saying, oh, tell your mom this, tell your dad this, tell whoever, whatever. The kids shouldn't be messengers for conversations that should be having, being held between adults. Um, that puts a lot of pressure on kids and puts a lot of stress on them. And don't speak negatively about the other parent in front of the children. They still love both parents um, equally. And that can really put a strain in their, on their relationships with both parents when they're trying to figure out how to please um, both parents. And if I'm saying, if I still love one parent one, I'm going to offend parent two or vice versa. And so just reassuring your, your children that you love them both, that you both still love them very much and that, you know, it's not, it's not their fault and um, that things will be changing and just being as open and honest as you can about the changes, but not necessarily the underlying issues that were the adult issues. Another um, difficult conversation to have with kids might be about race and um, skin color and what we look like and our cultural identities. Um, and so you can start having these conversations with your kids very early with young kids um, about your cultural, your own cultural heritage and what that means and what that looks like for you. And then expose your children to other different cultural opportunities. And here in South World, we're in South Florida, I think some other people on the who are here from other areas. Um, but here in South Florida, we have a really rich cultural, um, diverse experiences here. And just being open to that and experiencing ex um, things from different cultures that might be different than your own. And be honest with your kids about what you don't know about other cultures and work with your child to find some accurate information um, when they have questions about why maybe certain things are happening or what's going on in other parts of the world, you can um, use accurate sources to help facilitate those conversations. And one big thing to keep in mind is that conversations about race and racism might look different for different families and for different people. So there's not really um, any one right way to talk about um, diversity with your children. It's gonna be what feels right for you and your family. So for friendship problems, if a child is having some friendship problems and they're coming to you, you want to listen and empathize, ask those open-ended questions that we had mentioned um, before, ask them like, what bothers you the most about what happened? How did it feel when that happened? How do you think the other person might be feeling that helps facilitate perspective taking? Um, maybe asking them if they had a do-over, what they could go, what would they do different? Um, because we do learn sometimes from our mistakes and, you know, how we would do things differently. Maybe brainstorm some problem solving strategies together of how the child um, would want to go forward to help solve the issues that they're having um, with another with another child. Um, and you can also share a personal story about a time maybe when you had an issue with a friend and how you solved it. And allow your child time and space to proceed at their own pace. So maybe this is something that they don't want to necessarily solve right away, and that's okay. Maybe it's something that they want to solve, but you don't want them to solve, and that's okay as well. It's they're, they're developing the friendships, and they sometimes learn the best by kind of working through those issues and those things um, themselves with their friends, but for you to be the a safe place for them to come to with their concerns. So real quickly on natural disasters, um, again, it's the same kind of um, strategies as all the other ones. You wanna maintain calmness and ensure that you're in control. And even you might be feeling scared and worried, especially you know if there's hurricanes coming, like here in Florida, we have a lot of hurricanes. Um, and you can let them know that you're also scared, but that if it's true and they're safe right now, you can let them know that we're safe right now. Catalina, did you want to jump in? Um, be honest and straightforward about the event. Only provide the details that you know about 
And again, it goes back to, you know, not saying something that may not necessarily be true. It's just making you feel better to say it, but it's not um, true necessarily really true because if you don't know that that is everything is going to be okay like if your house was destroyed or something you can let them know that right now you're safe we're going to be taking these steps to get ourselves back um to a better spot one i think important thing is to help to ease some of those fears is to point out the helpers in the community the people who are helping the rescue workers the firemen the police um, who are there, who are making a difference for others. And allow your child to express any fears and worries that might seem unrelated, um, because sometimes when natural disasters occur, it brings out some other worries and fears and allowing your child to express those and oh. encourage them to reach out for any necessary support, whether it's from you or another trusted adult. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the themes that we really keep on repeating is that you can't resolve anything unless you're willing to treat someone else's words as important as your own. And sometimes with that also comes their behaviors and their actions when emotions arise. So there are five phases of emotion processing that were developed by two experts in early childhood education. And so really what what you should take into consideration and keep in mind is that humans, we generally move through these phases in this kind of sequence. Um, so in terms of allowing emotions to be processed, but they're not always at the same speed. So you may spend more time in one phase of the emotion processing than you will in another one. So the first phase is usually allowing them to you know, feel their emotions again, to a safe extent. So yelling, crying, maybe hitting a pillow, things that we typically do without really thinking and just feeling our emotions. So by keeping them safe, we want to, of course, make sure that they're not hurting themselves or others, but sometimes just needing to allow them to feel the things the, the way that they're going to feel them. You also want to provide some recognition. So again, labeling emotions, especially for younger children who might not know yet what, the, what it is that they're feeling. So if a child is getting really frustrated uh, because they want to play with a toy that someone else has, you can acknowledge that. You can say, oh, I see that you really want to play with that truck, but she's using it. That might be really frustrating. Or you that's so frustrating. You might be feeling angry. I'm, I see that you're sad, you know, again, empathizing with them. You want to provide security. So how can I help you feel calm? Or how can I help you feel better? What can I do for you? So again, you're saying that these emotions are normal and that they can be appropriate, but that the child probably wants to feel better. And so you're providing that sense of security. You might also want to provide some coping strategies. So not just providing strategies out of, the, out of the blue, but if this is something that you can teach your child beforehand and then implement in the moment, that would be most beneficial. So asking and giving options as well. Would you like a hug or do you want to do big jumps to feel calm? And finally, you want to offer some problem solving, again, trying to make it as practical as possible, teach them conflict resolution, and also help them move on appropriately. So you want to play with that truck and she's using it. Hmm, what should we do? You know, so maybe not just giving them the, the answers right away, but allowing them to explore their own thoughts and feelings to solve these problems their way. So um, we're going to kind of go quickly over these slides here because I know Dr. Warren wants to talk a lot about or give us some tips about um, reflective listening and how to engage in that with your child. So we, we have, again, some samples here of some phrases that you can use to reassure your child. Um, let me worry about that so you don't have to. You, you are not going to feel this way forever. Um, how big is your worry? How can we might make that smaller for you? 
Um, on the next slide, we have some additional tips for caregivers. If your child is not yet um, ready to discuss, that's okay. You can um, go for some conversations or discussions and when they're feeling ready, they'll, they'll come to you, especially if you're showing some of these um, open strategies. Um, one thing I do wanna know is that sometimes children express what they're feeling through um, writing, art and play in addition to conversations. So maybe that might be a time, another time to build in for you to, to have these conversations with your kids is through like a low key time such as, as play or, or art. Um, so building resilience kind of takes time and practice and um, you know, learning to adapt to things also can be hard. Um, and we can just help to children to um, realize that, you know, a lot of, sometimes we go through hard things and we go through tough times and that can help to normalize this for them, help normalize that sometimes a lot of people go through this and sometimes other people are going through the same thing that they are going through as well. And leading to these big conversations, you really just want to make sure that you're fulfilling your role by helping children cope. So this might look like providing routines and structure, but it also might look like modeling self-care and healthy coping strategies. So if you're getting frustrated in front of them and you can say, I'm really feeling frustrated, I'm going to take some deep breaths so I can feel better. In that moment, you're teaching them a strategy that they can use later on, right? So kids are always watching and they're always taking in the things that we're doing. You may also want to limit media exposure. So if there's something extremely negative going on in the world and it's too overwhelming for the child, you might want to limit that. Again, trying to keep things appropriate to an age level and developmentally. We want to encourage play and expression. And of course, always helping problem solve and guide them instead of just solving the problems for them. The final real consideration we want you to keep in mind is know when to seek a professional. So if you're seeing that a lot of these big emotions aren't uh, going away, you know, they're persistent regardless of all of your interventions, you may want to seek professional help for that. Also, importantly, you should know that therapy and talking to a professional is something that you can do even when things are okay, right? It's just another way to process our thoughts, our emotions. And even if you feel like, you know, oh, they're a child, they won't remember this, or, you know, they're too young for therapy, there's many different modalities and we can make it beneficial for the child. So on the next few slides, we have some book resources, both for caregivers and for children. And we also have a list of games that you can play uh, as teaching tools. So to teach some flexibility, frustration tolerance, turn-taking, empathy, et cetera. And so if you'd like to receive these slides so that you can look back on all of these resources, just put your email in the chat for us and we can make sure to send that to you. So to end our conversation, I'd like to spend some time talking about reflective listening and active listening and what that might look like. And before jumping into those nuances, I included a few quotes that really helped me create a framework when approaching difficult conversations. Because I think it's, it's half about the sentence starters and the content and all these tips that Catalina and Tyler have shared. And another half about having a way of approaching them, having a mindset, having a certain openness to leaning into these perhaps difficult experiences. One of my favorite authors um, that who talks a lot about these conversations and topics is Brene Brown. And she says, daring leaders are never silent about hard things. And daring leaders in this context can represent so many people, could be a teacher, an administrator, a clinician, a friend, a parent, anyone who that child is going to, looking up to, seeking out support from. And I think never silent about hard things is such a strong, powerful statement. You always hear like never say never, right? But this really speaks to how necessary it is to lean in 
to these very difficult experiences, even if it's incredibly hard, even if it's incredibly uncomfortable. And that's really where the title of this talk came from, We Can Do Hard Things, which that came from another one of my favorite authors, um, Glennon Doyle. And I think important for us to know that we can sit with that and still be okay. Renee also says integrity is choosing courage over comfort. And I keep this in the back of my mind because often when we're confronted with something hard, we think, okay, I've had a difficult day. I am not ready to deal with this right now. Or maybe I'll put it off until tomorrow. Or maybe I'm worried that having this conversation will really upset my child or might evoke really big feelings. Rather than choosing that comfort, right, avoiding or not having it, we're choosing courage. And in this context, courage is having these conversations, whatever that conversation might look like. So I try to keep that in the back of my mind, choose courage over comfort. And clear is kind. One of the things that Kathleen shared when she was talking about conversations about death, and this came up in several points of the conversation, is we don't want to lie to kids. We don't want to beat around the bush. We don't want to um, kind of scoot around issues. Clear is kind. It is hard. I feel like I keep saying that several times, but that's really a theme of this topic. It's hard, it's difficult, but it is the most kind thing we can do for our kids because when we're clear, we're not leaving ambiguity. We're not, well, to say we're not leaving questions is not correct because they probably still will have more questions, but we're doing our best to fill in the blanks because if we don't fill in the blanks, they will be filled, whether it's with their own ideas or seeking out information from other people. So to the best of our ability, we want, we want to be as clear as possible. When we're navigating these difficult conversations, it can be really helpful to develop safety rules. This could be family-based rules, it could be parent rules, it could be classroom rules. Kids are used to rules. They often kind of fight against them, but they really thrive with them. And so having some emotional safety rules can really help create a sense of, okay, I can bring up anything to mom or I can bring up anything to teacher and it might feel uncomfortable, but it will still be okay. So some examples, and again, this will look different depending on the person, the family, the context. Um, we've heard about I statements. So that could be one rule to start sentences with I statements and to make sure we're focusing on our experience, our perception. Language is something to consider. Some families are okay using curse words. Other families are not okay. It really, it doesn't matter necessarily, right? It's what's important and what's comfortable for your family and making that known to your kids and explicitly stated. Name calling is a good universal no-no. So whether it's parents calling one another names, calling others names, siblings calling each other names, it's helpful to create a sense of safety to say in this family, in this classroom, fill in the blank, we don't call names. Again, we're focusing back on ourselves and using I statements rather than attacking other people. Taking turns can be a rule, clarifying if you don't understand something. We heard about personal timeouts. That's a wonderful technique to use, a wonderful rule to have in the family that it's okay to not want to talk. We all have moments where we're just feeling too much and we can't think clearly. The idea is we want to put a time limit. So rather than I'm not talking about this, we can say, I'm, I don't feel like talking about this right now. Let's revisit it after dinner. Let's revisit it in 30 minutes. Let's revisit it tomorrow after school. A way different statement for a kid to hear. If they hear, I don't wanna talk about it, that feels catastrophic and it feels like forever. But if they know you're going to talk with them about it after dinner, they can say to themselves, okay, I can wait until then. The idea is you, come back after dinner or whenever you said, and then you make sure you follow through with that. And the little picture of the post-it note was put purposely here because it's also really important to acknowledge when we've said something that hurts somebody in the family or hurts somebody in the classroom. So a rule to say, oops, if you've done that, whether it was intentional out of anger, 
frustration or unintentional. You didn't realize that would hurt the other person's feeling. But to have a common ground acknowledgement that if you have your feelings hurt, you can share that with another person. That gives the other person the opportunity to say, oops. And if you're that other person and you recognize even before you've heard, you can say, you know, I was thinking about this. I wish I didn't say that. I wish I said X, Y, Z instead. Uh, Big Little Feelings is one of my favorite Instagram handles. They have so many helpful um, tips and thoughts, advice. One of the things I saw recently was raise your words, not your voice. It's rain that grows flowers, not thunder. So we feel a pull when we are having big emotions and these difficult conversations to become more animated, perhaps raising our voices. And again, we are human, so we want to have forgiveness for ourselves too, but know that our words really are one of our most powerful tools. And so we keep this in the back of our mind. Another thing that can be helpful at general principle is asking yourself, what's the most generous conclusion? So if your kid comes to you and they say something that irritates you, you might think, oh my goodness, I've been having the worst day and they are just trying to push my buttons and they're trying to get my attention. They don't care what I'm experiencing. That's so different than maybe they had a really difficult day and they want to connect with me and they need this time focus 100% on themselves. That's a really hard mental shift. But again, if we have this idea of what's the most generous conclusion in the back of our mind, it kind of trains us to at least consider the options, not jump to that negative bias, but to consider, okay, what's another alternative that might be less um, emotionally evocative for us? So how do we become a better active listener? We want to set aside time. And so that seems obvious, right? But what this looks like, we want to set aside time frequently every day. We heard Tyler start off this conversation by saying, use the ride from school to home. Use the time you're unpacking the groceries. Use the time you're sitting at the dinner table. Set aside time to have conversations with your kids, not just difficult conversations, but conversations in general and put down the phone. Again, sounds like a a thing that we might not need to say, but we are all used to multitasking and we feel the pull, oh my goodness, I need to finish this. Let me just do it really quickly. And that's fine. We can say that. Mommy's finishing an email. I'd love to hear about your day. Give me five minutes and then I want to hear all about it. And then when that time's done, make sure we have that undivided attention. We won't be able to do that 100% of our time because we have many responsibilities, but during these moments where we're connecting, we wanna focus just on them. And we said to talk about everyday things, not just the difficult things. We've spoken about sharing our feelings and paying attention to body language. And the last point is to really involve kids. So if you're talking to your partner and you're having a conversation and they're in the room, get them involved, ask them what they think about it if they have been in that experience before. To engage in active listening, we want to acknowledge our body language. And so what this would look like getting on their level if it's a little one, so rather than standing next to them, maybe we kneel down or bring a chair that's close to them the closest key also. So rather than talking to them across from the room, getting near them, that proximity helps them to feel like you're there, leaning in towards them, maintaining eye contact and listening listening to their body language. So if they're telling you everything is fine, the school day was great and they look miserable, we can comment on that. That's really a part of active listening, not just the words, but what is their body telling us? And to build on their statements. Tell me more, that's so interesting. What was that like? So if they say, my day was great, what was great about it? Oh, I got to sit with my friend at lunch. Oh, what did you all eat? The content doesn't necessarily matter. It's more that demonstration that you're interested and you're invested and you care and you're trying to get a sense of what their day was like. Reflective listening is putting back to them what you're hearing. So they come to you and they say, I failed my math test, today sucks. That's really hard. It must be frustrating 
to see that you failed your math test. So you're inserting new words, frustrating, that must be hard. They might not have said that, but you're showing that you're trying to get, uh, understand what they have experienced by projecting it back to them. Similarly, uh, paraphrasing and summarizing, maybe they share so much about their day. And instead of saying, wow, a lot happened today, you can say, wow, a lot happened. You did all of that after recess, and then you had that really difficult math test, and then you got to eat your favorite food at lunch. That's a paraphrase. It's saying, okay, I was listening, and let me show you I was listening by bringing back into the conversation some of the things I heard. And then responding rather than evaluating. So when kids feel heard, it's not because we're placing judgment. So again, if they fail their math test, why did you fail? How could you do that? You studied so much. That feels like a judgment. Responding with the paraphrasing and the act of listening helps them to see, okay, this is a safe conversation. And we have mentioned the last point too, waiting until they're done. I love this feedback toolbox by Brene, and I would recommend um, anyone to check out her website or her pages because she often shares many really important tips. And this one is meaningful in these conversations when they emotionally charge us. And so if we are talking to our kid or our teen, whoever, and we're trying to practice our active listening, but we are just feeling triggered or we are thinking, I am having a totally different experience of this conversation than maybe they're having, these are some of the sentence starters we can use. I'm curious about this. That's not my experience. Let me share my experience. Help me understand. Walk me through this. Again, our goal is to try to understand the best we can. And that's what's going to allow that child to feel more connected to us. Nine times out of 10, they just want us to listen. They don't necessarily want us to fix or advise or for us to tell, us, tell them rather what to do. And so we can even ask them before we have whatever conversation, do you want me to listen or do you want advice? And that's going to set it up for success because you're going to be cued into really what they need from you. Let's skip over this. We talked a little bit about this. Um, trust is not built in these big sweeping moments. It's built in tiny moments every day. And so if you're listening to this and you're thinking, wow, like there is so much I'd like to implement or so much I'd like to change, do, that's great. And it's okay because again, we are all on this process of learning and improving and growing. And it's not something where you can hear this and then tomorrow have the most beautiful, perfect conversations and all the hard conversations are gonna happen exactly how we want it to. It's more that all these tiny moments of connection and listening over time creates that environment where our kids feel um, open to coming to us. Now skip through some of them. I put some more Brene Brown stuff on here, but I'm gonna just go to the end. I can send the slides uh, like was mentioned before if you're curious. I'll just end with this. You don't listen eagerly to the little stuff when they're little, they won't tell you the big stuff when they're big because to them, all of it has always been big stuff. And that was so powerful to me when I came across this quote, because we are used to thinking, oh, they're little. So if they had, you know, a, a spat with their friends or something small happened at school, you know, not that big of a deal. It's okay if I'm making dinner while I'm talking to them or I'm like half listening. But this reminds us that for them, it might be a really big deal. And so if we can practice talking about both the little and the big stuff. Again, it sets this precedence that they are important to us and everything they say is meaningful. Again, not to say we have to drop everything 100% of the time, but we do wanna lead into those bids for connection as much as we can to show them that we are there for them. So I know we're at right at time 7.29. Um, feel free to put in some questions in the chat if you have them. I'll also put my email address. And so if you want to reach out, I can also pass along information to Tyler and to Catalina. Well, I see some people, I think Catalina did put my email address. I'll just put it again, just in case as I see there's a lot of chats there. Um, 
thank you again for spending time with us and for, for hearing all this content about having a, a difficult conversation. Please feel free to reach out so we can talk more if you find that helpful. Um, Tyler, Kathleen, any final words that you want to share? Now, I think that, you know, just coming to things like this is, you know, part of working towards a solution. So just learning how you can do your part and how you can encourage and be understanding of your children's parts. And again, being mindful that even though it might seem small to us, it, it might be big to them and just showing empathy there. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's great points, Catalina and Dr. Warren. And I just want to thank everybody for coming. I know somebody had a um, question about some additional resources for um, divorce and changing families. Um, I, I think we have, there's a link on the slide for a website. Um, we can uh, get, send some others or maybe that might be a possible future shark chat. Yeah, and I was gonna say, we'll try to make sure we copy everyone's email address who put in the chat. If you don't hear from us within the next couple of days, please do reach out to me. We might miss a couple of people, we'll try not to, but if we do miss you, please feel free to reach out so that we can get you what you need. So thank you all again. Have a wonderful evening.